We're glad you've chosen to listen to our weekly talkback. The weekly talkback is designed to take a portion of the teaching from this week to a deeper level. You may want to listen to this week's teaching, but it isn't necessary to understand the weekly talkback. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy the weekly talkback from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This morning's sermon, we talked about something that can be a little bit of a touchy subject, especially the week before Independence Day. And so for today's talk back, I actually wanted to spend a little more time talking about patriotism, America, the flag, and that sort of thing to more clearly define where as an Anabaptist congregation, as a Brethren in Christ congregation and denomination, we actually stand on this particular issue. In the sermon today, we talked about Thyatira. And in this particular city and in the churches, there's a, there's a woman and John calls her Jezebel, who's doing some idolatrous teaching. She's convincing people to follow her into idolatry. And um, if, if idolatrous teaching goes on, later in Revelation, we find that it's, it's known as Babylon, all right? This idea of Babylon. Babylon is any system put in place that competes with the reality of God's movement toward a new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is the ending place. It's where the story of the Bible comes to fruition. It's where there's a restoration of all things. Uh, it's a place that is ruled in peace. It's, uh, there's no war. There's no violence. There's no death. There's not even a church because everyone is unified in worshiping God. New Jerusalem is the end goal. Anything that gets in the way of New Jerusalem is labeled Babylon. An idol or idolatry would be labeled Babylon as well because idolatry is something that stands between you and God. The Roman Empire would have easily been thought of as the epitome of Babylon in biblical times. If you were in the first century, if you were reading this letter, if you knew John or you walk with Jesus and somebody says, well, what do you think Babylon is? The easy answer, the obvious answer is going to be the Romans. The Romans are occupying the world. They are, they're cramming down their taxes and their laws and their religion down your throat. You don't have much choice or much say when it comes to the Roman government. The Roman government is easily the thing that stands between you and the coming of God's new Jerusalem. Because the Roman Empire is the epitome of Babylon, then we as modern-day Christians, we need to reflect on the idea that every other empire that follows that empire, this first empire, could also be Babylon, could also be the thing that stands in the way of Jesus bringing new Jerusalem. And as an American, as somebody who was a part of the the most powerful regime ever to be on the face of the planet and certainly to be on the planet today, then I must ask the question of myself, is America an idol for me? Is there any part of me that wants to put America above my faith, that wants to put the Pledge of Allegiance before my relationship with Jesus, that wants me to put my flag, the American flag, over God? And if there's any part of me that sees it as an idol, then I need to remove that from existence. Because there cannot be anything between me and God. If I'm going to have a true, a healthy relationship, then I can't have it. So let's put it in this way. You and your wife, or you and your husband, let's just say that your spouse asks you to do something for them. Something simple, something easy. Take out the trash or empty the dishwasher. And your response is, sure, after I do the Pledge of Allegiance. I know this is a really silly example, but bear with me. So every time your spouse, the person you're supposed to love the most in this world, asks you to do something, you always say, well, just hold on. I have to do something for my country first, or I have to do something for my flag, or I have to say the Pledge of Allegiance first. It's going to feel pretty quickly, like you prioritize 
your country, your flag, or your pledge of allegiance over your spouse. Your spouse is going to feel like you prioritize them over. So how do you think God feels when God calls us to act a certain way? He calls us into obedience. But rather than simply obey God, we put country first. We put flag first. What do you think it means to God when God is brokenhearted over the plight of his people and rather than than be brokenhearted with him over the plight of his people, over the sin of this nation, or over the um, the rate of abortion, or over the rate of the homeless, like over the things that God is brokenhearted about. What do you think it means to God when we are more upset because some foot player, football players will not stand for the national anthem than we are over the very things that James, in the book of James, calls true religion. I honestly think that makes God sad. There are times in our life where our patriotism is an idol. And we don't want to hear that. For some reason, we find it easier to look at ourselves and look at our own hearts and decide if we have some other idol in our life. Oh, I I hold my kids in too high esteem. Or, oh, I watch too much TV. Or, oh, I consistently choose to smoke a cigarette over, go to Bible study. Like we find it easier to look at that stuff or to admit that than we do to admit that maybe something about the way we view our country and our flag gets in the way of our relationship with Jesus. And that's problematic. Why doesn't the brethren of Christ fly a flag in their churches? The brethren of Christ don't fly flags in their churches because of a couple of reasons. One is that Christianity is not owned by any one nation. So whether you are in Canada or you are in America or you are in Africa as a brethren in Christ, you won't see a flag in our churches because Christianity is a global family. It's a global community. It's a global call, and it's not owned by any one country. So if you're going to have flags in a sanctuary, then it better be every flag, not a single flag. The other reason is that the brethren in Christ historically are a very simple people. They choose simple buildings. If you were to go into any brethren in Christ church, you would find that it has been built in a way that is, for lack of a better term, architecturally simple. There's not a lot of ornateness. There's no huge statues. There's no great pieces of artwork. It's straightforward and it's simple. The brethren in Christ, the river brethren, they were farmers. They were people of the earth, people that work with their hands. And their goal at gathering together in a meeting house was simply to gather together and focus on the work of the cross, focus on who Jesus was in their lives. And so anything that got in the way of that, anything was a distraction, was removed. And so the brethren of Christ tend not to think about putting flags in their sanctuaries because we don't share the sanctuary space with anything else. That sanctuary is devoted to a time of worship. And while we believe that the time of the temple is gone and that uh, that a time is coming when we can worship on a mountain or in a temple, uh, that time is here, that Jesus changed all of that, we still regard the sanctuary as a place that is not shared. We don't share the front of the sanctuary with a flag, any flag. The front of the sanctuary is kept for the cross. The American flag also tends to represent various things to various people. And so for some of you, the American flag may be something you're incredibly proud of. And I don't want to take that away from you. That's not my goal in sharing this position with you. There's nothing wrong with having appreciation for America, especially what America is supposed to be. America was founded upon being the land of the free and the home of the brave. It was a place where you could come when you were terrified in your own country. You could seek asylum here. It was a place where you could go for a new life, where you could have religious freedom. It was a place where you could maybe own your own land rather than having to rent from someone else and pay unbelievable taxes. It was a place where you could be yourself. America doesn't always live up to that. So there's no problem with you believing in what America could be. 
But you see, the flag doesn't necessarily represent that to some people. Because America has also been the aggressor. So let me back up. The way the scripture is written, scripture is written to the underdog. It's written from the perspective of the underdog. So when we are in scripture and we are reading about David and Goliath, David is the underdog, right? Moses, Moses is the underdog. Moses fights against Pharaoh and the Egyptian. Uh, he's the underdog. Um, but when we tend to read these stories, we think of ourselves as Moses. We think of ourselves as David. When in reality, we have much more in common with Goliath and the Philistines and with Pharaoh and the Egyptians than we do with the main characters in these stories because America hasn't been the underdog for a very long time. And because we haven't been the underdog for a very long time, there are some people who see the American flag and equate it to terror or hardship, being in a place they shouldn't be, which is another reason that we don't want to fly it in the sanctuary because we want the sanctuary of a church to be a safe place where anyone can come and they can focus on the cross, not where they can come and they can be confronted with the flag of a nation who may have been the transgressor in a country that they're coming from or with a family that they're from. And that's a huge component of this too, is a recognition that everybody brings with them different pasts, histories, experiences. And there's not a reason that the flag needs to be in a sanctuary. There's not a, a specific reason. There's no call in scripture to have the flag of your nation in the front of a worship place because God's not owned by any one nation. The other component of this entire conversation is also the Anabaptist and Brethren in Christ distinctive around peace. The American flag, for many, represents war and violence and military and conquest. And again, it may not for you, and that's great, and I don't want to take that away from you. But for many, this is what it represents. The Brethren in Christ, the River Brethren, the Anabaptists have historically been a people of peace, a people who choose not the way of violence. And this is historical Christianity. For the first nearly thousand years of the church, Christianity was a peaceful religion. But when Christianity got mixed up with the government, when a guy named Constantine made it all okay, when the government eventually approved things like the Crusades, which was the killing of those who were non-Christian in order to obtain holy relics and holy land and retake Jerusalem, this, it got all mixed up. Suddenly, Christianity bought into this ideology of violence. And so it's not, just, it's not just America. I mean, at one point it was Rome. At one point it was England. At one point it was all these other countries that Christianity got caught up in their governments and caught up in their military machines. And suddenly Christianity became synonymous with these other things like violence. And then there's this movement of Anabaptism. And Anabaptist comes out of a Protestant Reformation, and suddenly you have these people who are saying, no, 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 what Jesus calls us to in Scripture is a way of peace. When Peter picks up a sword to defend Jesus from being captured and arrested in the garden, Jesus heals the man's ear he cuts off and says, Peter, put down your sword. Don't you understand? If I wanted to, I could have called many angels to, to me. I don't need you to pick up your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Consistently, Jesus calls us to nonviolence. He calls us to a humble position that may very well end our lives. And that's one of the things that I would just be honest with you and say is hardest for me. I am... I'm a person who would seek to defend themselves. And I have to pray continually that God would give me the strength that I need not to defend myself if that's what he's calling me to. By being nonviolent, by choosing a way of pacifism, it very well could mean my death and the death of people that I love. But is my desire to defend myself, is my desire to pick up a gun and shoot a perpetrator, is my desire to join the army and defend my nation, is that something that I'm willing to do over what I feel like God has called me to? The answer for me is no. Now the answer that we all have to come up with is different for each of us. And I don't say any of this lightly because I realize that this is a difficult conversation.
And in no way, shape, or form am I saying that if you're a soldier, or a police officer, or if you carry a gun, if you're prepared to defend your house, that you're not a Christian. All I would push you on is to say, how do you reconcile the nonviolence, the love of other, the love of enemy that Jesus calls us to with the fact that you're willing to take a life? That's the hard thing. And maybe it's different for all of us. And while I'm a pastor and I've had some years to think about this, I don't have a good answer for you. So I would ask you to prayerfully consider what your call from God is in this particular area. And I do hope that this has helped explain a little bit to you what I was talking about in the sermon today around America and idolatry and explain a little bit more to you why we don't have flags in the church. And maybe this isn't the greatest explanation, but it's the best one I can offer you on this Sunday afternoon. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together. Thank you.